Well, welcome back, um, or welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Um, this is the second talk of the second day of the uh, CDC workshop on applied epidemiology and environmental health um, by Dr. Lance Waller um, at Emory University. He'll be talking to us uh, about methods for incorporating spatial correlation in public health studies and analyses. Um, Dr. Waller is a professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at uh, the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory. He's a member of the US National Academy of Science Board on Mathematical Sciences and Analytics, co-chair of the National Academy's Committee on Applied and Theoretical Sciences. His research and interest involves the development of statistical methods for geographic data, including applications in environmental justice, epidemiology, disease surveillance, and disease ecology. Um, he has multiple publications, is a worldwide expert, recognized expert um, in these areas. And, and just like with Scott, I'm Dr. Bartel. I know I'm uh, not mentioning uh, a good number of, of his accomplishments and qualifications. Um, but we're really glad to have you, Dr. Waller. Please take over. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers have been fascinating presentations. Um, you'll see, I'll touch on some things that um, Michael brought up yesterday. Um, and some of the things Scott was just mentioning tie in because we're all talking, you know, all of the applied environmental epidemiology is about answering questions with data. So um, we'll have different components of this for each. And I've got the chat window where I can see it. If you put questions in, I'll do my best to keep up, but we also have the round table. I wanna check and see, do my slides advance? Somebody just say, sure they do. <laughs> Does that work? Yes. All fine. right, awesome. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, some of you may have taken a GIS class with me if you came to Rollins or a short course on spatial statistics. And if so, welcome back. You'll recognize some of my favorite slides. Um, so I think we start with, I think maps are cool and they're a way to communicate things. And, you know, really I like, there's a storytelling aspect of maps and there's lots of, lots. we always think of a story starting with someone coming in from a storm going in my possession, I have a map. And, you know, that's things like Treasure Island, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, when he was writing Treasure Island, drew his map first so he could place the story in context in terms of what's happening. Um, this is the map of Skull Island from Peter Jackson's remake of King Kong, and you've got the island in the middle and fog, written fog, there's fog all around. And if they had just turned the map sideways and maybe looked at this stain in the upper left, they would have said, oh no, there's a giant whatever there. Um, but we also map in things we hope will be there. Um, this is a map of, of the Alaska territory at the time. Um, the risk players watching will recognize Kamchatka here in Siberia. Um, and it include, I put, include this because it's got the Northwest Passage. It takes the Columbia River all the way through to Hudson Bay, which it doesn't really do, but into this French map at the time, they were kind of hoping there would be a passageway through here. And you can see that, um, the Alaska boundaries hadn't been mapped very well. You've got the, the archipelago here, but also I you know, learned a little bit of history that this whole green area was claimed by the Japanese at the time. So there's a lot you can find out in maps. Um, in the very first epidemiology class I took, which was in a veterinary school at Cornell, we used the Lillian and Stolle Foundations of Epidemiology book. And one of the pictures I really liked was this one. It's from a 1926 paper on endemic typhus fever in Montgomery, Alabama in 1922 to 1925. And it, it's not aggregate data. We'll use aggregate data soon. We've got point locations of where the cases lived, but they also had a map of where they worked. So this is where they lived and this is the same cases, but where they worked. So as an epidemiologist or an environmental epidemiologist, which one of these maps is more helpful to you or helpful is broadly defined? Anybody want to venture that in the chat? Would you rather have their home or their workplace for this one? Work. 
Yeah, it, it worked. why? Because we see a cluster here. So this kind of goes to Michael, right? Michael's talk yesterday. Ah, we want to point at the map and go, that's it. Um, we've got a bend in the Alabama River here. Um, the farmers sending the grain would stop here. There were a lot of grain silos in this area and then bakeries that would use the grain. They'd mill it into flour. And when you start putting grain and things like that in together, what else do you get in that location? Well, you often end up with rats or rodents because kind of led them to a rodent reservoir for disease. And the reason I'm showing this is we often don't get this map of where people live, if it's cancer rates or it's local rates and census tracts or zip codes, we get the map where they live. Or, you know, some of my geography colleagues would say this is where people sleep, but the relevant exposure might happen somewhere else. So people move around. And uh, as we're thinking about environmental epidemiology, we have to think about, you know, the map of the data we've got, but is it the map of the data we really need? Um, we're all familiar with Jon Snow. I edited the photo a little bit. Um, when I do this in PowerPoint, it's animated and his jaw drops and his eyes get bigger. And Carol Gottway, one of my longtime colleagues, added a sound effect of him looking at the map. Um, so this is my second modal slide, the second most popular slide I used. We've got Jon Snow with the maps of the cholera deaths in, in the Soho neighborhood of London in 1854. Um, he looks at the map, sees that the deaths are concentrated around the Broad Street pump, the small X here that you may or may not be able to see on your screen. That's not the only water pump because there's other X's around, but there seems to be this concentration here in the middle. And, you know, they took the handle off the pump and, and we've, oh, there's a couple of side things on this. First of all, I was looking for a picture of, uh, Charles Darwin and found this middle one in the top. And I thought, I've seen that picture before because it looks exactly, exactly like the Jon Snow picture. And it turns out almost all the photographs from Victorian England have the same pose. This is Robert Louis Stevenson on the right. We talked about Treasure Island. There's Karl Marx who lived in London. Um, this is um, Charles Dickens, also leaning on a table, sitting in the store. And this is Arthur Conan Doyle I put in because of Sherlock Holmes. He's about 30 years out of date with the others, but that's okay. And then Queen Victoria herself also sitting because of the type of photography involved. So we're familiar with the Jon Snow picture. Uh, can I enlarge it? Um, I don't know, but I can make these available to you if you want to um, send me a note. I'm happy to share the slides and you can uh, explore at your leisure. Um, the John Snow story has been kind of condensed to, uh, I mean, he did brilliant work, and I'd really encourage you to read some of the original stuff. It's very modern sounding, even though it's quite, you know, it's over uh, getting close to 200 years old. But we've kind of condensed it into a public health fairy tale. And this is a, a tour guide to London about in 1854, Londoners were dropping like flies from cholera until Dr. Snow figured out bacteria was carried by water. He turned off the pump, saved countless lives, and it's near the site of this pub. This was the entry for the John Snow pub. Um, but there's so much more going on here. I mean, Snow did more than just the one map we're thinking of. Others were making maps at the same time. <clears throat> and for those of you interested in the history, some of you probably read uh, Johnson's The Ghost Map book. Um, a lot of the technical detail from, for that came from Tom Cook's Cartographies of Disease. It is more recent mapping of disease books, which I find fascinating, but I would because I'm a map nerd. And then around 2000, um, Brody had a really nice overview in the Lancet, and Lancet articles are pretty short, but he gave, gave a nice view of um, sort of the public health thought process and policy setting at the time, and we're all a little more familiar with that in the, uh, in the COVID era uh, as well about how to react to emergencies. So one of the, uh, one of the things in the mapping of disease book is this, this graph of environmental variables associated with the 1854 outbreak. So this is the John Snow Mount outbreak. And along the bottom, you've got the epidemic curve or spike of cases of cholera and, um, and diarrheal disease, which line up pretty well, as you might expect. But in the background, you have things like temperature, relative humidity, rainfall. And we're looking at kind of what's the magic combination here to, um, uh, that triggers the beginning of this. So this is what we do in a lot of environmental epidemiology. And, you know, this is sort of data science or big data circa 1854, except now we might have hundreds or, you know, a thousand variables in the background. And we're kind of hoping there's this magic key that tells us what causes this to kick off. Now, I think it's also sort of sobering for what we do now with, you know, 
put, you know, I really don't like the phrase when someone says, we'll just throw a machine learning algorithm at it because that just sort of takes all the thought out of it. And, and I'm not sure what it finds by checking everything is necessarily what's the simplest um, explanation like bacteria in the water. So the bacteria in the water may be all influenced by these, but unless you're looking for that element, you're getting an echo or you're getting a list of ingredients for the recipe, but not, not getting the final description of how to bake the cake. Um, so do the maps tell the whole story? We tend to think Snow made his map and everyone goes, oh yeah, you're right. And you know, Snow won the day, but there were maps for, from the miasma group that it was caused by air that, that were the same deaths, the same pump locations. They were focusing on the gully holes or the storm drains because the air would be coming out of that. And potentially the, the, the hypothesis was they had dug into a mass grave from the plague um, a couple hundred years earlier and that bad air was coming up through the storm drains. But this, the storm drains are right next to the pump. So if you're building a pump that might leak, you might as well put the drain right next to it. So essentially it's the same pattern. One of them's biologically correct, the other one's not. And in fact, when Snow was showing this to the London Board of Health, Parks, in 18, kind of looking back on this in 1855, he starts off saying, this is kind of a long quote, but it's worth digging through, on examining the map given by Dr. Snow, okay, we've seen that, it would clearly appear the center of the outburst was a spot in Broadsteak, close, close to which is the accused pump. Okay, this is great. We're all kind of building up to this. And that cases were scattered all around this nearly in a circle. That's the cluster becoming less numerous as the exterior of the circles approach. It sounds like the park's seeing exactly what we see. And then his conclusion is, this certainly looks more like the effect of an atmospheric cause than any other. Because Park was saying, if it was due to the water, why isn't there a cluster around every pump? Um, and also the map alone, Snow gathered a lot of information on the individual cases, kind of linking to Scott's. So there were people who lived far from the Broad Street pump, but took water from the Broad Street pump. That was, they preferred that water and uh, higher death rates in that group as well. Um, but so Parks is kind of seeing what Parks wants to see here. Um, and when you put a map out, it is presenting facts, but people are seeing it through a lens of what they're familiar to. You know, are they seeing what you want them to see? Are they seeing what they want to see? And how can we use maps and spatial analysis to, to be a little more objective? My modal slide, the slide I use most often in any course, um, is actually not even my idea. I should have a, an attribution here that John Richardson was a toxicologist in EPA Region 4 when I moved to Emory quite a while ago. We were talking about GIS and he grabbed this scrap of paper and he said, it's just like this and it's just brilliant. So I asked him if I could use it and I've used it in courses throughout. And if you hear any groans, there's people in the audience who've seen it in my courses before and said, not again. Um, but I call it the whirling vortex of analysis. It's really the scientific method bent in a circle. And this is exactly what Scott was talking about and not necessarily in a geographic setting, but this holds in all of our, all the thinking we're doing in public health. Uh, trying to answer questions. So we start in the upper left. There's some question we want to answer. Is risk of childhood leukemia higher in, in children who are exposed to a contaminated well? Um, and then before we do anything, we should think, you know, what data and methods would we need to really answer that question? Like we need to know where the children live. We need to know which children use the well. How much water do they take in from the well? What's their kind of level of exposure? What's in the well? Why is it contaminated? And what are we concerned about? Does that have any relationship to the childhood cancers we might be interested in? So there's a lot of things to think about. And then there's the compromise we make, like we'd like to know where every child is all the time, how much water they're drinking, what else they're eating, what's their family history, but we might just get how many children were enrolled in schools for a given year in the middle of our study period. Now those children are aging over that period, lots of things are changing. So there's the data we can get and like Scott was saying, you can do different designs with different sorts of data. So maybe you work a little harder and get more detailed data. There's, you have more options, but you get, you, you find the data that are available. You take the methods you can use on those data and you answer some questions. You answer a variation of the question, but because you've compromised along the way, but you answer a question that you can answer with the data and the methods you have. And the reason this is, needs to go in a cycle is now you have to say, what question did I answer and how does that relate to the question I wanted to answer? So I'm gonna be thinking about this in the spatial setting, but Scott was thinking about it in terms of aggregate analysis. Michael was talking about clustering and the disaster epidemiology. You've got the pressure of time 
on all of this. Like there's the data you could get if you waited, but there's the data you can get right now. So thinking about what you can do with what you have, how to communicate that and how to put it in context. Usually this question you want to answer is a big question, a big general question. And you answer a specific piece of that. If you're only able to get aggregate data, you get aggregate answers. And the, the, or the ecologic fallacy would be is saying that the answer to your aggregate data question is the same as your answer to the individual rest question. So trying to, trying to put your results in context is what this figure is all about. The, the vortex part of it is you keep going around. Well, like I've answered this question. What else do I want to know? What additional data would I need? If I got that additional data or part of it, what else could I do? So, you know, no single study is going to go from box one to box four and, and, and answer the question from box one. It's really not, did I get the answer? It's, did I, do I know more than when I started? And there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges and you know confounding and things along the way. So the bet the more we know about how we process through this, the better we know how to make the next cycle through it. Um, now, some of the spatial things I want to give really quickly about geographic information systems, which are you know computer systems that put together design. They're really spatial database engines. So. They have a big visualization component because they can display the maps, but they also, the biggest thing they're doing is putting the data together. And you can do some of these things in R and Python, and you can write your own. But the kind of the beauty of the geographic information system is it's designed to treat the data with spatial references. So it's a database system or a bunch of database systems hooked together that include locations as well as the data values themselves. That means you can search and sort by location and distance and network distance and so on. Um, and the, the other values that aren't the locations we'll call attributes. So every data set consists of like a spreadsheet or a database table of attribute values and every row of that table is associated with a location where location might be a point, you know, latitude and longitude, it might be a line, like a street segment. This is how many people live on the street segment. It, or another attribute is what's the speed limit for that street segment? Uh, what's the contamination level of this stretch of a river? So line doesn't have to be a straight line. It can be a curve. Or areas, which would be the census regions. Uh, in the US, we'd have states divided into counties, divided into census tracts, divided into block groups. And then zip codes are sort of areas. But um, we'll talk about that some more later. So what's a GIS do? It can help put data sets together based on location. So, you know, in the olden days of pedagogy, we had transparencies and overhead projectors. So you might have a map, three different maps that you could layer on top of one another. And you try to line them up so the locations are the same across the three. So you, we tend to carry that language over. The data sets are layers. And we might have one data set that's a layer of case locations from, say, the state health department or from a cancer registry, let's say. We have a layer of road locations from the Department of Transportation. We have a layer of population levels that might be census counts for census tracts. And we might have an image background that's vegetation type based on remote sensing data, what kind of ground cover is in some place. And this is often going to be an image, so it's raster data, which means it's made up of pixels rather than administrative areas, lines, or points. But all of these can be layered on top of each other. And I mentioned a different data set, a different agency giving you each of the data sets. So the beauty of the GIS is we're lining them up by location to put together information from different agencies to use it for a public health question. How many of the cases live close to the road? Are there a lot of people living there? And you know, what's the ground cover type? Is this a vegetated area or is this paved? So the first thing every GIS will do is allow you to layer your data set. Here's maybe point locations of cases in the top one an exposure map of some factories and wind adjusted pollution levels, and then controls of, you know, it's not so interesting if there's a bunch of cases in an area, but there's also a lot of people. Like we're really interested in the risk, like what's the risk of the disease there? And that's estimated by, you know, number of cases over number of controls for a time period in a zone. Um, but we wanna be able to hook things together. This case was living in an area that typically has this yellow exposure and there's about this many um, people at risk. So you can start answering questions with layering without even doing any statistics, like do certain features in one layer occur in the same or similar locations as features in, in layer B? 
So you can have spatial case control studies or the cases kind of in the same pattern as the controls. Um, locations for buying alcohol, bars, and driving under the influence arrests. Are the arrests happening clustered around the bars? Are the police waiting there as people leave as an area? Or what's the best way to allocate liquor licenses to cut back on um, driving under the influence? Should there be a bar on every corner that's small, or should we concentrate them all in some place with public transportation? We can also do good things like library location and school performance. How do, how do children do in school if, they're, if they have access to a public library? And then some environmental justice examples. And this is a really old one here. I, did, I didn't do this, but this is from the mid nineties and we've done studies like this. This is Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, California. It also has one really big rural tract out here that's cut out. But these are census tracts from the 1990 census, shaded in by median income. So darker is higher income. And then the toxic release inventory sites from the EPA. Now these are sites um, that meet certain criteria. Um, so non-government employees, certain number, certain size of business that releases things that are typically listed on Clean Air or Clean Water Act and you know, be pounds per year. So this is simply mapping the location of reporting toxic release inventory sites. Would not be a complete list of all, all sources, but um, from that data set from the EPA and this data set from the census, we tend to, you know, this is where I would pause and ask the class, what do you see? Um, but typically you've got a lot of yellow dots in the lighter brown or lower income areas. You could do this with percent um, by race and ethnicity, um, also available from the census. It doesn't answer the chicken or egg question of which happened first. It also doesn't show that one of these dots might be a dry cleaner with some solvents and another one might be a silicon chip manufacturer. So there may be very different levels of releases. But you can see just by putting the maps on there, we start answering, there's some questions we can answer that are leading us around the cycle again. And we can think about what we would want to know next. What other data would we like to put in here? Uh, the second thing a, a GIS will do, and we talked about searching and sorting based on location, buffering, you can find uh, how, many, how many people live within one mile of a point. That's kind of easy to think of. That's a circle on my map. It can be in an area like this segment of the river. How many, uh, what's the, define the area, what polygons have some intersection with one mile, two mile, three miles of that segment. That could be a road or a, or a river that was contaminated. Um, or around an area like this is a school or a prison and how many people live within certain distances of this. So uh, I like showing the picture of the area like this one's got a little notch in it. You don't get exactly the same outline as you grow. It's, it's sort of if you traced over these out, um, boundaries of the Sharpie that was a mile wide, then you'd get this um, smooth area around it. So, then you can start answering questions with layering and buffering. Again, not doing any statistics yet, but you say, what are layer one might be my pollution sources? So those TRI sites or release sites. Second one might be residents experiencing health effects. These would be your cases. And then layer three might be the distribution of the population, you know, either the total population or those without, which would be controls. And you can answer questions like what fraction of the cases are within one mile or two miles or three miles? what fraction of the controls are within a given this, and are these fractions the same? Is the same fraction of the control population close or far? And that'd be sort of like, say, if you can fill in a two by two table here, which is kind of your quintessential epi table, exposed, not exposed is defined by closer than this distance and further than that distance. And then how many cases and how many controls? This is kind of the quintessential GIS environmental health study that's been around for a long time. Now, the the, comparing the answers you do get to the question you want. And you have to say, well, how did you define your exposure definition? Exposure doesn't stop at one mile. Um, should you consider a set of rings? You start to go around again and say, what if it was two miles? What if it was a half mile? But this is kind of the framework we do in often setting these up. You can also imagine um, a GIS-based environmental justice study would be, uh, instead of cases and controls, you might have white and non-white populations or the white and black populations and what are the fractions of the populations that are in the closer areas to the um, to the hazard. And here's a, a recent example. Um, just this spring there's a new journal called Environmental Data Science and I highly recommend this article. It has lots and lots of interesting examples in it um, by McGovern 
And there, the point of the article is why we need to focus on developing ethical, responsible, and trustworthy artificial intelligence approaches for environmental science. It talks some about AI and machine learning, but also just talks about answering questions with data. And they gave another example. This is similar to that 1996 example I just showed on Santa Clara County, but this is saying, is there racial bias in tornado risk? And or the title of their map are Black Americans underserved by the National Weather Service radar network. So the radar locations for Doppler radar, the, the radars that are used to get the radar signature for tornado warnings um, are the center of the green buffers. The green buffer is considered excellent radar coverage. So that's a defined buffer. Good radar coverage goes a little further into the yellow and they overlaid this on a county map of the Southeastern United States shaded in by the proportion of the uh, census population um, describing their uh, race as black. So what you can immediately see, and they did some nice transparency of these, so you can kind of see through the, the buffers, is the concentration of the black population or of the, or the proportion black is highest falls in these gaps between this. So does it say that there's more risk for tornado? The question we're answering here is, um, you know, are we getting the same coverage in order to monitor for risk in terms of what Doppler radar provides? Um, it doesn't mean that a tornado warning stops at these boundaries, but it does mean that if something happens in this space, it's not being picked up by the higher resolution radar and able to provide a warning earlier. So I think this is a really good example. There's, there's no statistical analysis or p-values or anything here, but it's still very informative. And you know, I think one of the things uh, Scott was mentioning you, in an epi textbook, you'll often hear, oh, don't use ecologic analysis. It's, it's, you know, it's not as good as it could be. And I think it's really important to keep the focus on individual level risk, but also not discount the, the value of really well done descriptive epidemiology. Um, I think there's a big need for answering questions and then putting those answers in context. They're not necessarily the final word on individual level risk, but they can be really important. So this is a, a, you know, a, a really lovely example of a couple of basic GIS operations providing some insight into some data that we wouldn't get if we just looked at the census data or just looked at the weather radar location data on their own. It's answered some spatial questions, but it's also generated some new ones. So an important point, like what do we see in a map? The pattern we're seeing in the map is a function of the pattern of what's really going on. Um, where are people at risk for tornadoes, for instance? Um, and also the pattern of observation, where are we looking to answer that question? And that previous one said, we're looking, we're getting better observations in the green areas than we are in the yellow or the gaps. So the data we're gonna see from the Doppler is not gonna include some of those spots. So there's some kind of hidden selection bias. Um, we kind of forget there's a spatial pattern to how we observe things. There's also the echoes of past interventions, whether those are public health policies or something like historical redlining in terms of which neighborhoods people were allowed to buy houses in based on race. Um, and th those things don't change fast. Even if you change the legal requirement, the echoes of that can hang around for a long time. So we have to remember that we're interested in the, the true process, where's risk high and that's causing disease and we're seeing that, but how we're looking for it is also generating some spatial component to this and where the, the background history of what we're seeing is, uh, has some influence as well. And then I kind of think of a line in the middle of this. I should have done this in two slides, but there's also something we need to keep in mind that there's the scale at which the true process operates. So COVID, we have our six foot social distancing. So you're at higher risk if you're close to somebody, but the fact that I'm at home with COVID and someone three streets over, that doesn't mean they're necessarily at higher risk because of me. Um, but if I'm only counting how many COVID cases happen in my census tract, we're all lumped together. These people who may not be able to transmit it to each other are sort of pooled together. So if the process is clustered, but you're only observing big areas and they're small clusters, you can miss that because you're also including a lot of, of background risk. So if the cluster you see in your day, if you're collecting data at the state level, you're not going to see the clusters that happen at neighborhood level. And then there's also the scale of precision. So the thing with a map is if you make a map with a lot of detail, people say that's a very detailed map and they assume the numbers have detail too. And this is a, an excellent example from that same article by McGovern. Um, 
it was a New York Times article that some of you may have seen about an AI company that was pitching their um, earthquake damage predictions to metropolitan areas and wanted to come up with detailed AI-based plans. So they, 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 they're simulating an earth a seven Richter scale earthquake here near Seattle, and then the red neighborhoods are most affected. And so in terms of emergency response plans and where to put things, that they showed this to the city council and this looks really great. And they're, they're like, well, we should sign up for this service and, and get a detailed thing. But if you run it three more, two more times, you get very different pictures. So the, the, the picture looks very precise, but the, the, it doesn't, the ge precision of geography doesn't match the precision of the prediction. This center area is kind of always highly damaged, but some of these other areas are high in some realizations and low in some others. So there's a lot more detail in the McGovern paper and they reference the, the Think article. So I would say the, space, the, the problem that happened there is the spatial precision of the, predict, of the prediction was consumed, sorry, the spatial precision of the prediction was confused with the precision of the outcome that you, what you were predicting. Um, similar things would happen with a map of, uh, let's say you saw a map that included your neighborhood and had local cancer risk. And you say, oh, that map has this detailed, funny little curve that's on the road. That's usually not on most of the maps. So the, the road's really accurate. So these cancer rates must be very accurate as well. You've made this logical connection because of the place that's not really there. The precision's not there in the data. So I tend to say a good analysis can really be a technological marvel, but a great analysis is always going to include, include some humility, like what question did I specifically answer and how does that relate to the motivating question? Now, the rest of what I want to present is I haven't done any statistics yet. So how do, what, what happens with statistics when we have spatial data? And when we have spatial questions, like why does this happen here? Or is the risk higher in some neighborhoods than others? We need spatial data. This is similar to um, like uh, Dr. Bartel's presentation. We're gonna need methods that recognize there's locations like things next to each other might be more similar than things far apart. And we need to give spatial answers. I don't wanna take this detailed map, show you a map of all my data, run a regression and say P is less than 0.05. Um, I've taken a whole lot of detail and I've given you one summary and it, you're losing something that just can't happen without losing some information. Um, so I have a spatial statistics book I bought once that has no figures in it. And I primarily bought it because I just couldn't believe they would not have any figures in it at all. Um, but I'm a very visual learner, which is why I like maps so much. So the maps in the middle of this not, aren't just display devices, they frame the questions. Why does this happen here? What do I know about this place? What do I know about this part of the place? It frames our data, it puts it in context so I can line things up with the layering, I can contrast it with the buffering. Um, it, maps are gonna give us methods like what's the neighboring values impact on this? And I wanna give my answers like, here's my um, map of associations and maybe the associations are different in different places. So it always comes back to the whirling vortex. That's why it's the modal slide because I keep putting it in more than once. So when we talk about spatial statistics, you can get into a bunch of notation and I'm not gonna do as much of that, but I was talking to some of our students who are studying for the qualifying exam. And I said, well, one thing to remember is that statistics as a field is supposed to make sense. Unfortunately, we don't often teach that way. We, we tend to sort of show off and say, look, it's statistics and it's hard and I know it and I'm trying to teach it to you. But the statistics are also what we report. They're supposed to make sense. This stuff is supposed to be helping us answer questions, not have some esoteric um, mathematical existence that's not connected to uh, the question at hand. And in spatial statistics, I think this is particularly helpful. I think maps have to be involved in this. And maybe not everybody agrees with me, but there's literature on how to think statistically, like how do I incorporate uncertainty in the way I think about things? There's maps um, about thinking spatially. How does mapping something help me understand a process? So the geography and GIS community has a lot of writing about this. And I think we need to combine these in a way and have, I, I wish I had a better name, but spatial statistical thinking is kind of the current, current version of that. So one of the first, one of the places where statistics comes in that can be helpful is when you're making a map, there's this tension between statistical precision that I wanna, if I wanna estimate disease risk or rates, 
I would like them to be precisely estimated. I'd like to have narrow confidence intervals on them at like small variance. But to get statistical precision, you need a big sample size. So if I have a map with everything located, that means I'm going to get better statistical precision in big chunky areas rather than small areas with not many people. So the geographic precision says make small areas so there's lots of detail in your map. Statistics says, no, 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 I want to aggregate things that are alike so I get better statistical precision. So there's this tension between having narrow confidence intervals for a local estimate and having local estimates at fine scale um, locations. Um, th there's an area of statistical methods that have been around since the 1970s on small area estimation. It says, okay, I want to keep the area small, but I know I'm giving up information. So I want to borrow some information from the other areas. I might borrow from my neighbors, like they're close by me, so they should be similar to me. Or I might borrow from everybody and say, well, here's the overall estimate and here's how my local area deviates from that. And to Dr. Bartel's presentation, that kind of fits into multi-level model um, because that's what random effects are trying to do. Say there's an overall level, but every, every neighborhood deviates it from it a little bit. And so the distribution of your random effects can say, how, how are you gonna borrow information from others? And what if you had covariates? Like what if I had incomes, SES, social economic status, or what if I'm interested in associations with the race, the racial profile of each neighborhood? I can, I'd like to include that too. And you know, I can adjust for it. And I know how to do that with Poisson and, and linear and logistic regression. So can I do regression models when my data come from these small areas? Um, if the observations were independent, we'd be ready to go. We know what to run. But what happens when these are dependent and that dependence um, has a spatial element? So we always have to remember, you know, everyone's heard George Fox's thing about all models are wrong, but some are useful. I tried to find an actual quote. And this is one of the versions that um, George Fox wrote about all questions are wrong, but the question, practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? And let's put that back in the whirling vortex. How wrong do they have to be um, to answer the questions inaccurately? So I'm gonna show you, uh, uh, this is a data set I had in my dissertation. So this is ancient history on papyrus, but Carol Gottway and I included this in our Applied Spatial Statistics for Public Health book that's almost 20 years old now. Um, but you know we're still proud of it. Um, and this is an area of central New York. Um, so I was in graduate school a long time ago, so we were using the 1980 census. We had 281 census tracts. Uh, this is eight counties in central New York, about 600 uh, leukemia cases for this five-year period straddling 1980, and a little over a million people at risk. Um, I know this looks like Wisconsin, but it's central New York. Uh, it's not a great map because it's actually sort of stretched side to side. I have some better ones. I have worse maps than this, but Cortland County, for those of you familiar with New York State, is right here. City of Syracuse and Onondaga County is here. The small census tracts. Tracts try to have the same number of people. There's a lot of variance, but if you see geographically small, that would be a city. So this is Syracuse. Binghamton is along the Susquehanna River here. Ithaca, New York is here and Auburn, New York is there. So there's some, there's some concentrations of population. Cortland, New York is here in the middle. Um, and there's some rural areas and lots of the little dots are, are lakes. So um, one thing I didn't notice in my dissertation is we had some outliers. We had three really high rates. And why did we have high rates? We had most of the trap, most of the cases um, down to the census tract level, but then we had a couple of cases where they were only listed to be in the county, and we said, well, if it's in Onondaga County, let's just put it proportional to the population size. And so they all got little fractional cases, but what happened is these three tracts here by Lake Onondaga uh, got a tiny fraction of a case, but had hardly any people living there, so the local rates are ridiculously high. Um, I'm keeping them in the analysis. I bring this up because Ordinarily, you'd say there might be some weird values, whatever. These three were all next to each other, and they're cut off by the interstate highways. So what had happened between the 1970 census and the 1980 census is this, the interstates have been built, kind of isolated this area that has sort of rolled over from being residential in the 70 census to being industrial by the 1980 census, and then having only you know three to five people living in. By the 1990 census, this would be consolidated into some other tracks. But I show this because this is one of those historical echoes of a fact that influenced the data that we had. 
So uh, what we were doing Poisson regression, the number of cases is of interest. So we have the case count uh, for region I, this would be a tract of number 100 or 281 of these. But also for every tract, we had an expected count if there were no covariate effects, that would just be the overall rate times the number of people that lived there. This goes into a Poisson regression as an offset is the name, but it's essentially we're turning our counts into rates. Like here's how many we saw, here's how many we would expect if our covariates didn't have any effect. And we'll look at three covariates. One is an index of uh, whether, how many, what fraction of the people in the track owned their own home, uh, sort of a measure of income. What fraction in the tract were over age 65? Um, and then uh, the inverse distance to one of um, 11, I believe, waste sites that had trichloroethylene. This was done in the late 1980s following the Wilbur, Massachusetts uh, childhood leukemia cluster, and trichloroethylene was the contaminant they were interested in. Then it's got um, it, it's leukemogen evidence, is, there's some epidemiologic evidence, it's not particularly strong but that we were focusing on that um, to kind of see what would happen in New York if we were proactively looking for patterns similar to what Massachusetts had been addressing. So that was of interest at time for the state health department at Cornell, they had or at New York, they had reached out to my advisor, Bruce Turnbull at Cornell, and that's the data that we started with. So the Poisson regression is that the count of cases follows a Poisson distribution with the expected number, and then a log linear, because they take the log of y, and here's your intercept and your three covariates. This would be our standard. Word. There should be a plus psi here because that's my random effect for being in tract I. So we're assuming these expected ones are known. The, the YIs over the EIs give a standardized, mortal, or, yeah, standardized mortality ratio. They could be age standardized or based on some um, external or internal rates. I'm just using the total cases by the total number of people. Um, the model is here. Uh, this is exactly what I had on the page before, except I did write the, the random intercept here. These are an adjustment for each of the tracks, like here's the overall pattern, and then there's something that goes up or down here. And that allows me to have over dispersion in the Poisson regression model. Um, I know some people like to do um, negative binomial versions of this, which you can you can do if this follows a certain distribution. We're going to just add um, noise to it. So it's the, the random intercepts have mean zero. They're not adding any trend overall, but they add a little more variance to this because the Poisson distribution, the mean and the variance are equal. It's kind of locked in. You want to add some flexibility to that. Or we could say these random intercepts are spatially correlated. So they don't, they still have mean zero. I'm not adding any trend. But if one of those tracks has a high random intercept, that's neighbors are probably high too. And you know, a way to think about this, if we had all of us sitting in a classroom in rows and columns and I gave everyone an envelope, you open it up, it has three numbers in it that are temperature measurements taken at your seat earlier in the day. And I ask you to average them in your head and raise your hand like a human thermometer on how hot it is at your seat. And you kind of assume that it's like your neighbors, but you also want to be the smartest kid in the room. So you do the average in your head really fast and you put your hand up and you notice the people around you, all their hands are lower than yours. So I look at the person in front of me and to my left and to my right, and they're all lower. And I, go, I must've made a mistake. So I'm going to hedge my bet a little bit and slide to something closer to what they're doing. They're also doing the same thing. Mine's higher than theirs. So they're going to go up a little bit. What happens is I'm borrowing information from them. I'm not pooling all their information into mine, but I'm taking their answers and adjusting what I'm doing. They're doing the same thing. So overall, the extremes get pulled in a little bit. And I'm using more than the limited data in my envelope, but I'm not using all of the envelopes around me. So I'm, I'm this compromise between what my data tell me and what my neighbor's data tells me. And that results in what's called shrinkage. So if you have the, the, the random intercept is the mathematical way of putting it in there. When you do this, your um, overall standardized mortality ratio is now a compromise between the local one based only on your tracks data and the, the global average if I'm doing the over dispersion one, or I can also shrink towards my neighbors. And shrink doesn't mean every number gets smaller. It just means everybody sh shrinks in. It reduces the variance away from the mean. So spatial random intercepts would have a compromise between your local SMR and your, your average um, SMRs and shrinks to the average of your neighbors. And you can actually do both of these in the same time. You can fit the model 
and it'll do shrinkage to the global estimate, borrow information from everybody, and borrow a little more information from your neighbors. This is sometimes called the B-Side York and Mollier uh, model or the BYM model from an influential paper in 1991. So how do we fit these models? These are often fit, and there's a whole flurry of papers of them after 1991, because that's right when Markov Chain Monte Carlo came out. And this kind of shrinkage is sort of custom made for that kind of um, fitting. So Poisson models with a random intercept that borrows information from its neighbors fits right into how Markov Chain Monte Carlo works. And there are several R packages that do this. Um, and then Markov Chain Monte Carlo takes a long time to run. Integrated nested Laplace approximation is what in-law stands for. That's a mathematically elegant and computationally much more efficient way to do it. It's an approximation, but it runs way faster, but it's a little more difficult to, to code. Um, there is R code to do this, um, and there's books on how to do it. I have one in the reference section. So when we, we run this, we get an estimate, we can get a point estimate, and you can have a confidence interval, but it's largely defined by these posterior intervals that have come from the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. This is the, in Bayesian statistics. All of your inference is based on what do I think the distribution of these, inter, these parameters are given the data that I saw. So the intercept is sort of centered around one. The three, the three posterior distributions I have drawn here are one of them is only using the um, over dispersion or non-spatial random effect. The other one's using the spatial one and the third one's using all three. And you can see they give similar estimates. They're borrowing information slightly differently, but it means there's a strong enough signal in the data. That we don't have to, um, we don't get wildly different answers whether we borrow spatially or not. There are other examples where spatial can help more. Um, there is an age effect. The older your population, the higher your risk. Zero is down here. Um, the home ownership is mostly negative. If, if a higher proportion own their homes, the risk goes down. That kind of matches our idea of you know, higher income might mean lower risk. And then the exposure effect is small, but still positive. All the evidence we have tends to focus on there being, um, there being a, a slight increase in risk associated with it. Now, if you're like the table description, uh, these are just the posterior medians, the middle of those curves I just showed, and um, the quartiles that reflect 95%. And um, you can see for age, it excludes zero. For the exposure effect, again, small, but excludes zero. And the home effect, the 95% one doesn't really include it, but it's, you know, if you look at 80% of it, it's, it's most of it's to, to the left. We can get the estimated um, standardized mortality ratios, which would be estimates of like relative risk times 100. We shaded the positive values, the higher risks, uh, solid and striped the lower ones. So you can kind of see we've got, those of you who are keeping score of where the cities were here, Syracuse, uh, Portland, Binghamton, Ithaca, and Auburn are the higher. So there's, there's, there's some element of the urban rural that we haven't accounted for well yet. Um, you can see the three hot outliers were there in the highest ones. We could also, instead of, and this is, this is sort of my example of why maps are helpful for explaining it. This shows where the model's not fitting quite as well. This is where the model says the risk is high. And then I could say, well, is it significantly high? Or if I want to say, what's the probability that's high? I could shade in the tracks where the, the, the standardized mortality ratio is bigger than 150 or the estimated, or that's like relative risk bigger than 1.5. And I shade it in by the posterior probability. So in the cities, I'm still saying there's a higher risk um, based on my data of um, this. And I can make the same map of SMRs greater than 2.0 or relative risk uh, bigger than two. Um, so what you'd expect is the is this number you're setting, the level you're trying to see which ones of these have an SMR higher than that goes up, fewer of them will light up, but some of them still have a pretty high probability, bigger than 80% of having an increase of more than um, twice the risk, the background risk. So what do I have here? We have associations between local covariates. I had an estimate for each of those and outcomes for my counts and rates. I allowed there to be spatial correlation in the random intercepts, which generates um, the smooth estimates and spatial correlation in the rates. Um, 
And so the local rates are adjusted for the covariates and smooth to their neighbors. And there's a lot of examples of this in the literature and our packages and a lot of extensions. And we've had some discussion with the um, environmental health tracking program through CDC on, you know, the, the routine, the GIS is becoming a, it used to be kind of a boutique thing to do. Now, a lot of places have access to it. There's a lot of um, training, a lot more training in public health than there, there was 20 or 30 years ago. So it's moved into more of a routine component of tool. It's still more niche than just tables, but it's not, um, it's not so strange to have that included anymore. Doing the spatial regressions is a skill set that when I started learning it, I was a graduate student. When I started teaching it, it was to doctoral students. Now I have a lot of MPH students who take the class and our book was kind of aimed at um, professionals who knew how to do regular regression and so on and were familiar somewhat with probability, but we weren't trying to write the next hardest book. So we're trying to help move these things from technical um, things you can write a dissertation on to tools you can use. So that's a, that it's not a fast process, but we are interested in where um, people are interested in applying this and how to use it. So just to wrap up, I think maps are really cool. I think I'm not trying to be facetious with that. I think if you think maps are interesting, it makes you motivated to want to make better maps. It makes you evaluate maps you see. You want to see someone has a report with a map in it, and it really makes the results accessible. So we have a lot we can learn from each other on how to use maps as communication. Um, geographers are great to talk to about this. Cartographers have lots of good ideas. Um, um, Cynthia Brewer's color brewer stuff is um, just phenomenal. And, and she and Alan McEachern did a lot of really interesting consulting with the Census Bureau and NIH in um, the 90s on how to display things. Um, so the maps are going to generate questions, which is really good, and they can start to answer some of the questions. And when questions are spatial, you need a spatial answer. So I, you know, I don't like having a map that turns into a number. And then the methods you use depend on what data you have and what question you want to answer. I think you could put this for any of our presentations in the workshop here, all four of them. Um, all these models are wrong, so we have to have some humility with that. Um, I tend to start with simpler analyses and start adding complexity rather than try to do the hardest thing out of the box because then I don't know why it doesn't work. And I think it is important to have that last step. You have to maintain some humility that I, this is my best answer so far. This is what I'm seeing that we didn't see before, but it makes me want to think um, about things a lot more. So uh, the textbook, again, I, this is almost 20 years old, but um, you know we, we like it. Uh, <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, applied Spatial Statistics for Public Health Data. Bob Haining has an older spatial regression book from about the same time. Andrew Lawson has a lot of great textbooks, um, multiple ones on spatial public health. That McGovern paper, I highly recommend this just as a bunch of great examples and just engaging good questions. And it's not, it's not way out there AI description, but it's really saying, what does this mean in environmental science? Uh, the Blank Giardo and Cominelli is a textbook that has the in-law code for spatial and spatiotemporal. Uh, Mor Moraga was referenced in um, uh, some earlier presentations too. Her geospatial health data has fantastic R examples in it. And then the Diggle and Giordi model-based geostatistics also links to their R data. So these are more modern books than ours um, and include, and as more modern books are more directly tied to software. And I believe that's the end of the presentation. So I would be um, very, you know, welcome any, uh, we have a few minutes for short response questions and then we'll have more time with the, um, the round table. And if you can distract me with great maps you like, then, you know, all the better, so. Well, Lance, let me just interject a very, uh, much we might very much appreciate your talk. It was really very useful, very nice, and I see a lot of compliments over there in the the chat. So that that's great. <clears throat> um, thank you. So let me just start with a general question. As you said, we have the roundtable coming up uh, a bit later. The the one with Dr. Waller will be at, starting at three. We'll have uh, forty five minutes starting at three. So. Anything that doesn't get addressed now, hopefully we'd, we'd have time uh, then. <clears throat> Let me just start with a sort of a general question. Um, you know, you presented a lot of information and, you know, a lot of motivation um, 
for someone who's new, how would how would one what's a good way to get started? Perhaps with your oh book? yeah, that, that's a really good question because you know when you're when when you start reading the literature, it some people. A lot of us write to impress our our competitors or our, you know colleagues at the at the edge of things, and um, you know I, I, th this is sound a little self serving. I think our book's a pretty good place to start. Um, I also think there's a really nice um, GIS for health applications that Esri puts out. It's got a lot of detailed. I use it in my class for labs. Uh, it's kind of you. It's I was gonna say it's U.S. based. It's Pittsburgh based. All the data are from Pittsburgh because <laughs> it's by some people at the University of Pittsburgh. But it does show you how to do a lot of things. Um, GIS is a different sort of animal to learn than programming in the sense you're kind of dropped in the middle of a window and with all kinds of buttons and and menus and if you know you right click on something and something else happens and you left click on it. So it, it, there is a little bit of learning to swim by being pushed in the pool with um with gis but there's a lot of good video tutorials and um so health gis tutorial for health is the name of the textbook um i for the when we have the um round table i can put some specific references in the chat um but yeah i think so our book doesn't do gis it talks about if you know statistics and you want to in public health and you want to do spatial statistics in public health here's some ways to do it and here's some probability things that are helpful but um some of the sort of standard things we lean on in statistics all the time don't work quite right in the spatial setting so it's a place that welcomes a lot of pretty good ideas rather than the most theoretical. I mean, there's some beautiful theory involved in it, but um, keeping it focused on the questions has been really uh, what I've spent most of my career on. Well, thank you. That's uh, <clears throat> good, good, uh, good advice. Um, this is kind of, this is left over actually from, or uh, we waited to ask you, uh, Dr. Goodman and I, um, because we know it's your area, uh, but, and, and you partially addressed it, I think already, but um, the question was, I think yesterday, during his talk on cancer cluster investigation, in that context, what might you recommend for mapping, producing the maps? And, and I think the probably the emphasis was on the software. Mm -hmm. And maybe- Yeah, I think, you know, making good maps of the geographically referenced data is helpful in, can in cancer cluster discussions because it provides this context. Like, are there a lot of people living here? Um, where are the roads and, and, and other things? It puts, it puts the, the cluster concern in context. Um, and it might be something just like uh, one group is using a one mile buffer and another group's using a three mile buffer and they get different answers and everyone's caught up on their answers are different. But then once you realize their answers about different summaries, it helps you understand why they might be different. So, if, you know, there's, a, there's several clustering kind of um, tests you might do. And if, if the, the scan statistic I see is mentioned here, we can talk about that as well. If, if a scan statistic says there's no significant clusters, but somebody else's statistic says there is, I think the thing to keep in mind is that, that hypothesis testing mentality, we don't have to get into whether you like hypothesis tests or not, but it's saying the null hypothesis of there's no clustering is very general. And every one of those tests has a specific type of clustering it's looking for, like what, what it would count as evidence for clustering is. And in the case of the scan statistic, the default is circles. You could also do ellipses, but you could have a cluster that say C-shaped and the circle that catches it includes a lot of background. So it doesn't look like in the circle it's high, but if somebody else's method allows you to catch the shape, it might be able to notice that it's high rate in an un, you know non-circular shape that's hard to or if it was all in a really long line along a road, you could either have little circles that don't capture the whole cluster or a big circle that captures the whole cluster, but most of that circle is the background rate, so this, the alarm bell won't go off. So trying to understand each of these methods has a way it's answering that, is there a cluster question slightly different. There's an implicit model of what a cluster is. So, um, so I think that that that's helpful for me is is in terms of software sat scan I use it a lot and I also use I often use it at the beginning like let's see what sat scan says is there but then I like to move into more specific tools that I've learned how to use over time that I, I feel dig a little deeper 
and um, have a more general shape. So we've done some examples where SatScan says it's not, there's not really significant clustering, but one of these like Special. density estimation one works, gives you a little more, good. more a more detail and more nuanced answer. So given the time, it's uh, 145. Now it just turned over on mine. Um, and can we end with a very simple or an interesting question? That somebody asked, what is your favorite map? So. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it'd be it, the easy ones to say Jon Snow. But it, to me, it's anything old I haven't thought about before. Um, I'll say I have one in my office that was sort of a delight to find. And it's out of an atlas. And I found it in a like the bargain bin of a of a map store. And um, it has the North and South America and where mammals live. And then it has what plants grow at what level of the Andes. And then for whatever reason, it has an inset with Java and Sumatra and a line drawn. And in German, it says Asian animals pointing one way and the other one says Australian animals pointing the other way. And this is what's called the Wallace line. Uh, Wallace was one of Darwin's contemporaries. And he noticed that along that archipelago from Asia toward Australia, there's a line where you get marsupials, you start seeing marsupials and you stop seeing monkeys and different birds and, and continental drift had them further apart. Now they're closer together, but that line is written in this um, atlas. So I, I love finding stuff like that, that somebody was looking at this, thinking about it and they were moved to write something on it. Very neat. I, I think one of mine is this uh, map of Napoleon and the Russia campaign. Oh yeah, that's- It's kind of a, I guess a lot of people uh, I point that one out. That's an excellent one as well, just because it has so much information in it. I think yeah, those are kind of uh, cool. Well, thank you again, Dr. Waller, a great presentation. And I'm sure people will be looking forward to the round table uh, in, a, in a little bit. We'll take a break thank now. For attention. And we'll, we'll try to get back to some of these chat questions um, in the round table. Okay. And so we'll take a break until um, the round table with Dr. Bartell starting at two. 15 minutes. Well, thank you.